Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David and do you ever stray into a field that you don't know enough about and you just have to ask for help from a grown up? Well, today I'm joined by Derek from DC Today Light. How are you doing? Hello, good here. So hopefully you're going to know a lot more about the subject matter of ham radios than I do. Yeah, I'm a little bit of a ham radio nerd, so I've been playing around with uh, VHF, HF radios for a while now, and uh, hopefully I can offer some assistance in uh, this teardown. So I have here a, a Trio TR9130. And uh, I'm told that that was something which could be fun to tear down. Again, I, I don't know much about it. Yeah, so the uh, it actually, Trio, I believe, was uh, later turned into Kenwood. I'm not sure the whole history behind that, but uh, two meters, uh, the transceiver you have there is uh, probably one of the more popular frequencies that are used in uh, amateur radio. So it's a VHF radio. Um, oftentimes you'll use those particular two meter radios to contact what's called a repeater, which um, is a separate station that you can uh, transmit to and it retransmits that signal over a larger area so you can reach more people. And uh, I believe this particular radio um, was initially manufactured in 1982. So I'm sure you'll see some uh, lovely 80s style electronics. Uh, these older radios are usually really densely packed. so. I'm interested myself to see what's inside. Well, let's start. You've mentioned two meters. You mentioned VHF. Two meters is the wavelength, right? Yeah, two meters is the electrical wavelength of the electromagnetic wave that you're actually transmitting um, that propagates through space. VHF. Um, what's the range of VHF? Because two meters is very specific, but VHF is very high frequency. Very high frequency. Um, so that's up to Oh, don't quote me, 300 megahertz and uh, 300 megahertz and beyond that is considered UHF. VHF and UHF are typically line of sight, although you can get uh, with two meters some interesting propagation characteristics. The way the wave propagates through space, uh, you can get things like tropospheric ducting and refraction off of mountaintops and, and things of that nature. Okay, so my first question, I have a uh, black and red lead presumably ground and well, positive and negative, and I have a 10 amp fuse on it. Now the voltage on the back of the device is 13.8 volts, which is very specific. You have an FM and an, I believe that has SSB capability, which is single sideband AM. So during large excursions, when you're yelling into the microphone on, on SSB, it will pull large amounts of current. Um, FM, you have a constant carrier and you're varying the frequency. Okay, so that's your, Probably not pulling that much power. I think that radio goes from five to 25 watts. Okay, because I've never really thought of that before. So the power you're outputting is representative of the amplitude of the wave? Uh, so it's actually unique of radios of that specific era is that people used FM, they used single sideband, but single sideband fell out of popularity uh, as those repeaters that I mentioned before became more popular. So everybody was talking on the peter, repeaters and nobody was talking direct line of sight to each other anymore through SSB and it just kind of fell off and they just stopped manufacturing it across the board. Okay, uh, so I've also got here the microphone, the handset. It's got two buttons for up and down as well. What do they do? Yeah, so you can uh, usually on a um, base station transceiver like that, you can uh, up and down the frequency by I think 100 hertz. It's also got uh, a mini DIN connector. I think that's mini DIN or something along those lines, a little five pin job. We've got this, which is VHF, two meter wavelength. And this is still classified as ham radio. So what's the difference between ham and CB? because CB is a word I know, but I don't know anything about it. So CB is, uh, stands for Citizens, Citizens Band, as I think a lot of people know. And Citizens Band is basically, um, anyone can go into a store, purchase a CB radio, and go plug it into their 13.8 volt supply and uh, start talking to whomever. Uh, the only exception is I think um, Channel 9 is reserved for emer emergency communications. I think it's channel nine, right? I'll take your word for it. And to be honest, my frame of reference is Die Hard. And I think that rings a bell. 
So the difference between CB radio is anybody can use it. You know, it's, it's free for the no public to use. Uh, the frequency is around 27, just about that uh, megahertz. Uh, whereas amateur radio is um, more of a public service by definition, um, but it offers a lot of experimentation that you can do. Uh, there's really a million different facets of it that someone can get into, but the main key is that it is a licensed service. So you do need to uh, take an exam to get your call sign, and then you have to use your call sign um, during you know, regular operation at periodic intervals to stay in compliance. Okay, so I'm assuming at this point that the AM in HAM stands for amateur? Uh, HAM, actually the term comes from uh, people being ham-handed or ham-fisted when they're doing Morse code. That's what I understand. Now there's a lot of debate about that, so that's my understanding of it. So I've, I've also got to ask, because this has obviously got the antenna connection on the back and it's a big coax connector. Would that connect direct to an antenna or would this have to go through some sort of amplifier or preamp? That particular connector um, is an SO239, that's the receptacle, um, and the male end is called the PL259. I don't know if you can see that. Oh yeah. Um, so why they have two different names, I have no idea. I've actually looked it up and not been able to find out any information as to why they're called something different. Um, but that would be connected straight to an antenna. That explains why this has got a huge heat sink on the back, so it must be doing that level of amplification. And the interesting thing about the SO or the PL259 connector is that it is called a UHF connector, but is not actually very useful at UHF. It's typically <laughs> used in VHF equipment. Of course. So you, you say the amplifier for the antenna is actually built into this back panel? Yeah, those radios usually have a uh, like a brick amp that has all of the components inside. So you just feed a small signal RF into it and it probably connects to like a uh, some kind of output filter, bandpass filter, and then straight to the antenna jack usually. Oh, Mitsubishi. That's a big boy. It's a unit and you can see why it's attached to that huge heat sink at the back. So let's see. I mean, there's a fair number of wiring looms here. I assume we're going to have to sort of cut the miniature cable ties that very neatly hold this all together. A pair of very small sort of coax connectors there. Uh, and I would assume one of those is transmit and one's receive? Yeah, I would think so. Oh, weird. I've never seen anything like that before. It's a little three pin uh, connector. Actually straight onto, is that a MOSFET? Straight onto the pins of that transistor, maybe? Oh, wow, I've never seen that myself. Wow. That's that's a first. That's unusual. And still screwed down to the chassis for heat dissipation, but unfortunately, all the input connectors, so that's the power, backup power, key, auxiliary standby, and XTSP. Oh, the old external speaker, in case that 8 ohm job isn't good enough for you. There you go, that would make sense. External speaker is a 3.5mm jack. The standby connection looks like the next size down. Um, next size down from three and a half mil, is that two and a half mil, I think? Uh, was it 2.8? So, yeah, something along those lines. And then the top, so you've got the auxiliary, which is like a, honestly, it looks like an old connector that you would use on a audio equipment in the 1950s. <laughs> that's probably, yeah, that's probably for an external amplifier. So when you're in SSB mode, remember I, I was saying that if you're not talking, it's not, uh, there's no RF coming out of the radio. So if you connect that to an amplifier, the amplifier doesn't know when you're transmitting if you're not speaking. So you can actually use that to trigger your amplifier to turn it on uh, if you hold the, the key down on your handset. I see, clever. And it, it also acts, there's a, what's called an ALC. So the amplifier, if you're driving the amplifier too hard, the amplifier can talk back and control the radio's output power through that. Uh, connector. It's pretty typical on on uh, all radios that have external amp capability. Okay. Man, there's so much detail to this that if I was trying to understand this on my own, I definitely would have been out of my depth by now. So I'm because these looms are so sort of interwoven. I've got some connect some pins that from one plug that go backwards, forwards, down to the other side of the board, and 
I think it's probably better off to try and disconnect the whole lot. I'm about going to find more issues than solutions with that. Yeah, probably. It amazes me without the you know advanced software that we have today where we can just slap things together on the screen and make them in real life, um, how they would come up with uh, fitting all of this gear together, you know? Especially, I know you've done teardowns on cameras and things like that. Just, it's amazing that they, without modern CAD tools, could do this with these tiny parts and all of these connections and somehow make it look neat like that. Yeah, the most impressive single thing was probably the 1990s video camera. So long just to work out how to get it apart without breaking anything. And not that I ever even attempted to put it back together, but I just, I don't like to break things. But it was so, like you had to do that screw from that PCB, lift it off slightly, get a screwdriver in. So like, how, no wonder this thing cost a fortune. The people in the factory must have spent days trying to make every single one. And it makes you wonder how many revisions they went through before it actually went to production. Oh, hundreds, I suspect. Okay, so there were two connectors that went through the other side to the other board, which based on those two coax connectors, if they are transmit and receive, would it make sense that one side was for transmit and one side was receive, or is it more likely to be that one's FM and one's AM? It's difficult to tell, especially with this radio, because you have SSB, which is AM and FM on the same board, and I believe that the FM is usually a dual conversion process and the SSB is a single conversion, down conversion. So when you're receiving an FM signal at say 146 megahertz, which is about two meters, um, that 146 megahertz does not propagate through the entire chain from uh, receiving it until it goes to the speaker. What they'll do is they'll take that 146 megahertz, they'll run it through a mixer with a local oscillator. So two different frequencies coming together through this mixer to bring it down to like 10.7 megahertz typically, which allows them to reject other frequencies that we don't want and just pass the frequencies that we do want. Um, and then you can use standardized components, standardized, um, you know, blocks of circuitry that are pretty common components are common and then they'll take it and convert it back down again to 455 kilohertz um, and that just makes it easier to process the signal and components are more available there's less parasitics to deal with when you're engineering these rf circuits so the ssb is a single conversion process where that only happens once so i would imagine that they would have these um probably part of it in one section and the other dual conversion part, maybe on the same board. And then there's usually a VFO, which is what your, that big knob on the front, the tuning knob is connected <laughs> to that, that feeds those mixers. So yeah, I'm having trouble. Some of these knobs just sort of pull right off and some have got sort of grub screws or set screws and I really can't tell which one's which. And I don't want to just reform the whole lot and break it. So I'm very carefully just sort of working my way around all the knobs. One thing I will say, I absolutely love coaxial knobs. Yeah, really common in the older stuff there. Yeah, but they're just really pleasing to me and I don't know why. Just trying to work out what the grub screw on this main knob is. Oh, there you go. That feels, no, yes, no. Yes, there we go. So that's a very, oh, I was gonna say that's a very pleasing encoder and I assume it's like a, an electronic one, but I think that might be an optical encoder, like a, an old mouse. I wouldn't be surprised if it is optical. A lot of the ham radio stuff usually has a nice en encoder, optical with a little disc and everything. Yeah, I can um, see the, the black wheel with the notches out of it. So hopefully we'll get to see that soon. So I've just got this one last knob on here, which doesn't want to come out. So I was just looking, because th these LEDs, they've got like one leg soldered to a wire going off into the wiring loom, but the other leg's like soldered onto a lug that's driven into the faceplate. Uh, so they must be using this faceplate as a ground plane. Oh, that's interesting. I've never seen that before. I mean, for the sake of one extra wire, would you bother? No, <laughs> I wouldn't. It must be shielding. But then again, I guess in an automotive environment, when you're dealing with what's probably a grounded chassis anyway, it's not too much of a stretch. I mean, it straight, seems strange in like a domestic environment, but automotive more understandable. Speaking of, does that board have a conformal coating on it or anything, or is it just free open? Um, I can't see anything that would resemble, I mean, everything on here so far is through hole and none of it looks conformally coated whatsoever. Yeah, I think this is a single-sided PCB because look how many jumper wires there are on this side. 
Wow. That's it, huh? One board. That's that's the bottom side. So that is the underside. The oh. top side split into others. But yeah, that is a single-sided PCB. Single-sided, single layer. Everything is through hole with a handful of jumper wires on the top side. And pretty dense too. It's very dense. It's just a handful of uh, capacitors on the bottom side. And bless this one little one here where they've had to sleeve up one of the legs because it's a little bit too long. Yeah, that doesn't look like fun to troubleshoot. So let's carry on aimlessly tearing chunks out of this side. So I've got this extra shielded box in bit here. Any bets to what that's likely to be? Uh, probably uh, a lot of the front end stuff, I would think. Maybe the VFO or the variable frequency oscillator, voltage control frequency, uh, variable frequency oscillator. Okay, so you've got like a little sub assembly inside the main major assembly. And let's get the connectors out. There's definitely a crystal there. Oh, and we've got an old Toshiba, a TC9125BP. Again, single sided PCBs through hole components. You've got that one Toshiba I see on it. Oh, is there a glass diode in that uh, Celastic area? No, I've got a couple of uh, transistors, a capacitor, a lot of resistors, a little inductor. Yeah, it's, it's tough to tell with the this high density stuff, everything looks the same. You'd have to trace it out in the schematic or find out where the IC is and find out what it is exactly. Yeah. But with all of these, I kind of wonder, this must have been an evolution. So is there like a previous generation of radio like this that is just enormous, full of discrete components before it was organized enough to miniaturize it to this kind of scale? Like that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, that answers that, yeah. Yeah, that's probably it. And then of course, I'm guessing there's a generation after this where it all went to the same way so many things have done, where there's just a massive single integrated circuit and anything that comes in any sort of size form factor is a power supply, the single IC and a load of wires coming out of it nowadays. Yeah, everything from what I've seen, teardowns of modern equipment, it's all you know, obviously surface mount and uh, maybe, maybe dual layer boards. Ooh, dual layer, getting fancy. Yeah, but you won't, what do they call it? Double loaded. Uh, but you won't see massive wire looms like that anymore, really. No, I mean, this surprised me even, uh, well, I guess this is kind of in the ballpark of the LaserDisc player. And the LaserDisc player was a little bit newer and there were a few sort of flat ribbon connectors kind of thing. But it's kind of feeling very similar in terms of the, the PCBs used and the big wiring looms. There you go. So again, just more single-sided boards. This one's actually got a tiny little transformer. That could be an isolating transformer, given its size. It almost looks like an audio transformer. Could be. I mean, there's a lot of caps in there. That could be audio filtering. Yeah, or part of the modulation side of things. Wow, that's never been taken off. No, that has not. That's, that's beautiful, though. Why are you hooked around pressing in the case? There you go. Wow, that is a loom. That is all the fixed wiring going to the amplifier at the back and all of the controls and encoder at the front. And it's weird how much there is just going straight. Well, all the wiring goes to the front and then back out again, which is crazy. That is a lot of wire. Yeah. Surprising. It's almost like the switches are the main driver of the hardware, which I, is that sounds ridiculous, but when you consider how few integrated circuits there are on the rest of this, I guess they kind of are. Can you see the integrated circuit? Is it on the front panel or the... It's this okay. little PCB, which is just hiding. That's that vertical one that was hidden in there. And it's super neat. You've got uh, NEC D650C, uh, 22nd week of 82, I reckon. Gosh, this is an early one. I guess so. Um, and a little uh, Hitachi I see, and a little Texas Instrument I see. But the the outputs from there, oh, hold on. Um, I wonder if there is a separate display driver on a daughter board in the front panel. No. So I've got this socket 41 here, which would have plugged in there. That makes me think that one of these is a display driver. Yeah, some kind of transistor array. It's 
There's a lot of I.O. on that uh, microcontroller. I've clearly still got a little bit of work to do to understand exactly what's going on here and understand all the components, but I would have been even more lost if you hadn't joined me, Derek. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It was uh, fun watching you tear this thing down and speaking to you during the process. And uh, let me know when you get your ham radio license so that we can uh, talk over the air sometime. I'll send you my call sign. All right. So thank you so much for watching, everybody. If you have any questions for me about the specifics of the electronics inside, or if you want to ask Derek something about ham radios, please head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye, guys.